Hello, everyone. It's July or August. Oh, my God, the year's flown. It's August 14th, 2021, and you are listening to the Sapphire Nation live podcast. I'm Sapphire Ed. I am the North American PR representative for Sapphire Technology, as well as the company's gaming evangelist. And we're going to be here, we're here once a month, and we're talking about various topics in computer gaming and computer hardware, and giving you a chance to give feedback, to talk, to have live discussions, and give and countertake. So we're back to do this again. Uh, Now, for those of you that are new, this has actually been around a while. This is actually the 11th episode we have done for this. But I had some health issues in February, and it's taken me this long to really get to the point that I felt like I could sit up for an hour and and do the show the whole time. Uh, Real quick shout out to all the people from Million Man Land that are coming over to join us for this. Uh, Great land event in Louisville, Kentucky. Normally, I would be there with them enjoying the event, but for health and for COVID reasons, I'm not this year. The good news is next year we hopefully will all be able to attend these events and enjoy this, but at least this way we get to have the breakout group. All right, so we've got a plethora of topics to cover, um, and Sear actually started me off with a pre-show question that leads us right in to topic number one. And the question he posted was, is Sapphire Boost similar to what FSR is doing, and what's the future of Trix Boost in a post-FSR world? That is a great question, and it's where we're going to start. Now, if you head over to sapphirenation.net, you'll see I actually did an article where I took a look at FSR in relationship to Trix Boost in a couple of games. Now, let, let's describe what Trix Boost is doing because I'm more familiar with that than I am with the inner workings of FSR. So the idea behind Trix Boost, and it's an idea that's been used in multiple video games over the years, has been you can reduce the render scaling. So let's say your natural resolution is 1440p, but you can reduce that by 5% or 10%, and then the monitor will upscale the image so that it looks like it's a 1440p display when it's actually rendering at a lower level. This allows better performance. Well, when you add in the ability AMD gave us for adding sharpening, you are able to lower that resolution scaling slightly and not lose any image quality. And the result is basically free performance. Now, FSR and DLSS both basically work on the same principle, all right? Now, they're not doing it the same, but the principle is the same. They're allowing the game to be rendered at a lower resolution and then upscaling the game. They use different methods to do this and presenting it at the resolution your monitor is properly supporting. So this allows for better performance. FreeSync versus FSR is real, not FreeSync, I'm sorry, it, it's Trix Boost. I don't know why I've got FreeSync on my notes. That's just, that's just silly. Oh, I know why, because I needed to discuss something about FreeSync later too. Um, FSR versus Trix Boost is an interesting discussion right now. Because the way it works, this is this. And, and again, if you go over to Sapphire Nation and read that article, you'll, you'll see where I talk about this. FSR at ultra level is performance-wise about the equivalent of Trix Boost at about 85%. Now, what that means is this. You are reducing the quality, the rendering scale, by about 15% over native with uh, Trix Boost. FSR has actually reduced it by more than that. It's, re- it's reduced it by close to 30 But FSR is doing a bunch of tricks under the hood to really ramp back up that image quality even though it was rendered at a lower scale. So if you want to compare FSR to Trix Boost, compare ultra quality to what Trix Trix Boost is going to do. They're going to get confused by all these acronyms. The advantage Boost has 
over FSR right now is Boost works in approximately 90% of the games on the market as they exist today. And that's a pretty big deal. 90% of the games plus already work with with Boost. And the way we can make that do that is all we're doing is changing the actual um, resolution that the game renders at. So how Trix Boost works is, is this. Unlike FSR where you just turn it on. For Trix Boost, you go into the Trix software and you set the scale that you want it to set to against the native resolution of your monitor. And this will give you the resolution you want to go into the video game and set to achieve the level of Trix Boost you just set up. So there's an extra step. Little more trouble to set up because of that extra step, but we don't have to wait for developers to implement it. So it's a great solution. But where does that leave us as FSR takes off? You see, FSR is, I'll freely admit it, it's a better technology. It's a better technology because you're getting even even lower rendering scaling and the image quality is up. What my experience found at 1440p gaming was that FSR at quality level is impossible to notice the image quality difference during gameplay in most of the games I tested. I, well, all the games I tested, I couldn't find a game that you could notice the image quality difference in. Now, I know you're going to go to some websites and they're going to say, well, we've taken a look and here you can see the difference in the image quality. Look, when it comes to playing a video game, there's a very simple rule of thumb that we all as gamers need to accept. If you have to take a still of the video game and zoom to 200 times to be able to clearly see the difference in image quality, there is no difference. In the discussion, it's done. And that's what's really cool about FSR. It's what's really cool about Trix Boost. You can actually get a, a decent performance uplift, and you can't tell the difference during gameplay. Not enough to make any difference. And so these are wonderful features. But, now here comes the but. All of these have the same, the same issue. As we've gone forward in technology, some of this isn't necessary. And it's not always going to be necessary in every game. If you've got a game that you're already running 150, 160 frames per second with, why would you lower the rendering scaling? Oh, sure, you can get some extra performance, but is it extra performance you can actually benefit from? And and this is something that doesn't get discussed too much. Um, as for the post, post world for Trix Boost with FSR, as FSR becomes more available, I, I think that the need for Boost is going to continue to exist for the older games because the older games aren't going to get FSR support. The newer games are. But... If you get a choice between using FSR or Trix Boost, you got to look at FSR. FSR is a really great option. And once it gets baked into video games, it's going to be a wonderful thing for people to use on a regular basis. Uh, that was a great opening question, by the way. Thank you. Um, speaking, of, speaking of Trix Boost, then, and speaking of resolutions and speaking of gaming, oh, you know what? We're going to back up for a second. I Because I mentioned FreeSync earlier, and I said there was a question there. I've seen this question a lot in Reddit in some places. I thought, let's address it here real quick. If anybody here has this question, I see people comparing FreeSync and G-Sync, and, 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 uh, or V-Sync, FreeSync and V-Sync, and they don't understand that there is a drastic difference. G-Sync and FreeSync are, for all practical purposes, the same thing. But they don't understand that FreeSync and VSync are two very, very different things. Okay, so the purpose of VSync is to stop a game from rendering at a, a point that's faster than the monitor can accept it. So if your monitor has a native refresh rate of 144 hertz, this means rendering up to 144 frames per second, your monitor can display just fine. But as soon as you go past 144 frames per second, anything past 144 is just wasted because your monitor can't keep up. It can't do it. And the purpose of V-Sync is to cap it and to hold it down. The problem with V-Sync was V-Sync 
introduces a micro stutter and a, and a level of latency into the gameplay. And the reason for the micro stutter is is when the refresh levels dropped below the refresh rate, when they dropped to like a third or a half or whatever, there was a drop in the way it was displayed because the monitor could only go down in steps. Now, FreeSync, Adaptive Sync, G-Sync, whichever term you want to use, all works on the principle that there is a range within the monitor that the monitor can adjust based on the frame rate given to it by the video card. So let's say you have a 144 hertz monitor, but you're playing at 100 frames per second. The monitor adjusts its refresh rate to that 100 frames per second to allow every frame to display correctly. And this t- eliminates tearing. It, it pretty much does away with tearing. But FreeSync does nothing for capping the top. So how do you solve that? How do you solve that when you've got them both? And I've talked about this in breakout groups and in other discussions before. Here's a solution I do. I turn on FreeSync. I use FreeSync all the time, but I never use VSync. And what I do is, is I change the detail levels of the game to keep the frame rate under the refresh rate of the monitor. So I typically don't play games at ultra detail level. The reason why is I don't think it's necessary. The difference between ultra and high is usually just a performance hit. But if on high I am exceeding, let me turn this off in the background here. If on high I am exceeding 144 frames per second, I'm wasting frames. So I'll turn up the detail level yet again. Now your goal should be, when you're setting up a monitor, everybody thinks they want to run all the time. I want my average frame rate at 144 frames per second because I have a 144 hertz monitor. That's a bad idea. And the reason why is that average is exactly what it says. It's an average. It's the middle of a bell curve, which means you're going to have frame rates well above 144. You don't want frame rates well above 144. So what you want to shoot for is to tune in the detail level since your average frame rate on a 144 hertz monitor is probably in the neighborhood of 110 to 115. What that means is you're always going to be within the refresh rate of the monitor, maybe occasionally bump out of it, but it'll be occasionally. And you don't have to turn on VSync and deal with the mess it gives and still get the ability to cap the frame rates before it gets above it. Now, what if you can't? What if you've still got the issue of that you're going above it? Then I use virtual super resolution, and instead of 1440, I run it 4K. And again, we go back through the process. So you can find ways to do this without having to use VSync. But comparing VSync and FreeSync, are, it, it, it's just not the same thing. VSync uses a little bit of everything, uh, Lord Quack. It, it does a little bit of everything. Um, Bolivian asks, what do you think of using Chill? I've used Chill with it. Chill, though... You have to really set the parameters narrow in Chill. So Chill lets you set an upper and a lower frame rate target that you wanna that you wanna get set in. And the idea behind that is is to reduce the power that the GPU has to draw, but at a certain point to bring the power back up. The concept is really cool. The implementation was a bit wonky if you had that range too big. Now, if you set that range narrow, you set that range at, say, 130 frames per second at the top and 100 frames per second at the bottom, that worked really well because you didn't get a wild fluctuation that would take place. But if you if you leave that fully open, like the full range of the monitor... It, it, it gets some wonky behavior. So I don't, I'm not a big fan of chill. I use it if I don't have any other way to limit the frame rate. I want to stay away from VSync, though, because VSync introduces that latency and stutter, and I don't want the latency and the stutter. All right, let's see here. Had to mute the mic to cough. All right. So, elephant in the room. 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it launched this week. The Nitro and Pulse 6600 XT video card, which is being listed as the ultimate 1080p video card. And I was amazed at the response and dismayed at the response all at the same time. So let's cover a few basics. The 6600 XT is, yes, I'm going to say this here. Most people won't. I'll say this here. The 6600 XT is essentially a 78 or a, a 60. I'm going to get this right in a minute. 5700 XT, too many numbers. I wish it was simpler naming conventions. It's essentially a 5700 XT that is much more efficient in power terms and it adds in the ability to um, add. Um, ray tracing, which we're going to get on to in a little bit here. So that's what the 6600 XT is. This makes it a monstrous 1080p gaming card and a good 1440p gaming card, especially when you add FSR or Trix Boost. You add those features to it, and it's capable of really high refresh rates, even at 1440p. And it's coming in at a less wallet breaking price point <laughs> okay y yes i know we would all like to see better prices i'd like to see better prices i'm a gamer too um uh, but pricing is what it is right now and i'd be happy to get into discussing pricing and what the issues are with pricing if you guys have questions on that the end result though is is the 6600 is just a great card at a reasonable price point that didn't actually have terrible availability. It actually released with a fair number of cards. No, I can't give the specific. But what I can tell you is the demand was ridiculous. It just was insane. We didn't expect the demand to be as high as it was it, it, because, again, we, we thought, gamers but mining came back so everything kind of got blown blown up um the 6600 xt everybody's like well why is 1080p a relevant gaming card it's 2021 because 1080p is still a relevant gaming resolution 1080p and below account for 80 plus percent of pc gamers still today we can't ignore that. That's a huge segment. 1080p at high refresh rates is still fairly demanding. Uh, I mean, the 580 could do it some, but let's face it, until you moved up to the next generation, it was very difficult to push those numbers that high. And now we've got good 1080p, good 1440p. We're going to get into why that's not interchangeable in a minute. Um we got good 1080p, and the 6600 is delivering that. It's giving you a good option. Now, the question I get asked the most about every release of the card is, what's the difference between the Pulse and the Nitro Plus? Let's break this down into simple terms for everybody. The Nitro Plus is the bling card. Nitro Plus, we add RGB graphics. We add software adjustable BIOS switching. We add RGB motherboard control, removable fans. We add all the bling to it, up the clock speed a little bit, give it a little more robust power delivery, and that's Nitro Plus. Pulse is essentially taking the, the reference design that we're being given by AMD and then we put the sapphire twist to it. We up the quality of the motherboard. We give it a little bit of a clock boost. We put a much better cooling solution on it. But we remove all the bling. And that allows the Pulse to be sold at a little lower price. Which is better? It depends on what you want. If you want a blingy, show-off, RGB extravaganza of a video card, then obviously Nitro Plus is your choice. But if you just want a great gaming card and have the price as low as you can get it to get that level of performance, Pulse is probably the way you want to go. All right, let's see what we got here. Let's go down through a few questions, and then we'll tackle the next topic. Um, uh, message history, 
you should be able to scroll back and see the mess's history, Jens. I'm not sure why you're having trouble with that. Uh, I thought we turned that on. Uh, it's a little late for me to turn it on now, but it's something we can look at in the future. Uh, Breaking Dives ask, uh, Sapphire GPU is getting better over the past few months. I'm going to jump into that when I jump into pricing. There's a reason for that, and and, and you'll find out in a minute. Um, let's see here. I said the better cooling on the Nitro Plus. It's a more robust cooler. Um, was it individual sales, or were there only OEMs buying them up? We do not sell to individuals, Lord Quack. We sell only to distribution houses and to um, places like Amazon and Newegg. We we don't sell to the individuals. Now, we do sell to the OEMs, but a lot of the OEMs also buy through distribution houses. So I, I, I don't know where all the sales went. I don't deal with the sales end. Unfortun well, fortunately, I don't want to deal with the sales end. <laughs> um, but there's, there's no set answer to that. Okay, so about supply. We're talking about pricing again here for a minute, and, and we've discussed this before. We we have had this discussion before, uh, but we're going to do it again. Uh, hold on a second. I want to get this where I can see it, and then do this. I'm trying to get everything positioned on my screen. I need a bigger screen. I'm going to have to get a bigger screen. I'm trying to get to where I can see everybody and see what's going on. Um. Pricing. Let's discuss CPU or GPU pricing in the market today as it exists today. I, I've seen this discussion where people are saying it's not just supply, it, it's other factors and everything else. Um, and and um, Bliv pointed out that the 6600 is more compact than some of the other cards, which is a great feature. Um, small form factor building is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. You guys know I'm a small form factor aficionado and also an open frame uh, build lover. I love small PCs. And I like the fact that it's a small form factor, but that's a whole other level of story. Um, so let's talk about pricing and why the pricing is what it is today. When people talk about the shortages of the hardware, they tend to think only of the chips. And the problem is that's not where all the shortages are lying. I want you to think about something. Is there any major appliance in your home, washer, dryer, refrigerator, range, air conditioner, microwave, television, radio, stereo, is there any major appliance in your home that doesn't have a circuit board, that isn't electronic, and the answer is no. Even your cars have circuit boards in them today. Motorcycles have circuit boards into them. Hell, there are bicycles with circuit boards into them. Your watch, your phone, everything has a circuit board. And they all use many of the same types of components. Transistors, diodes, capacitors. All these things are used. And all of them had their factory shut down for a short period of time. All of them. Now, when you take that into account, most of that market is on an almost daily supply basis, and you shut down for a couple of weeks, that demand didn't shut down. In fact, the demand for all of that stuff has picked up. So it's not just the CP or the CPUs and the GPUs that have the shortage of production. It's not just the silicone and the chips. It's practically every component that goes into making a video card. There is less supply than there needs to be to handle the load that we've got. Take that and you add in PC gaming is taking off. It's increased. The demand for video cards has gone up. Mining. Mining keeps yo-yoing, but mining's on the comeback trail. And video cards work really well for mining because of the fact they do massive amounts of parallel processing. So mining drives the demand up. So now the demand is driven up through the roof. Almost all of the shipping of these items is, are done by bulk. They're done by ship.
But there were only so many ships, and much of that bulk space for a long time was restricted to medical supplies. Now, that's begun to open up. But again, there's this demand to move stuff, and the price goes up. So the price of components went up because there's more demand than there is supply. The price of shipping went up because there's more demand than there is supply. New taxes and tariffs pretty much around the world. That increased the pricing. All of this stuff combined to send the pricing to just stupid levels. And I agree with you all, it's stupid levels. It's crazy what the pricing is at. Unfortunately, this is the economy we live in right now. I wish I could tell you there was a simple solution. I wish I could tell you that there is a way going forward that is going to somehow alleviate this. The way going forward is to get through it and see what comes out on the other side. There is no set answer here. I'm not going to be like everybody else and try to blow sunshine up your behind and 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 make you think that somehow it's going to get better and we're going to do everything in our power to make it better. We are doing everything in our power to make it better. But there's only so much we, there's only so much AMD, there's only so much NVIDIA, there's only so much any AIB can do to make this situation better. And they're all doing it. So at the end of the day, we all wish pricing was better. It's not. Pricing sucks. We all know it sucks. But this is the economy we live in. This is what we have to live in. And we're doing our best to try to find a way to keep the pricing under control. But the world of supply and demand marketing. And if the demand is higher than the supply, the price goes up because the people can get more money by selling it. Uh, to me, the biggest evil of this, I don't even think it's the miners. I think it's the scalpers. I can't stand scalpers. I can't stand people that, that want to profiteer off of what we're doing for our enjoyment. And I'm not talking about the companies that make the stuff that actually give us something. I'm talking about assholes that just, yes, I said assholes. I'm, I'm talking about people that just go out and buy the stuff to turn around and resell it at three times the price. I, I think they should all be, well, okay, I'm going to behave. Jens ask, why do you think graphics card manufacturers are using weird cooler heights like 2.2, 2.5 instead of full slots like 2 and 3? It's about trying to keep the size down, Jens. As people want silent video cards, all right? that That's what they want. They want a silent video card. They want a video card that runs cool. And in my my personal experience, they have unrealistic expectations on both. And to accommodate that, you have to make thicker, bigger coolers. You have to use bigger fans. You have to take different approaches to make this work. So when we make a 2.2 or a 2.5 slot card, what we're trying to do is, is make it as thin as we can. This accommodates all different build sizes, small form factor to full size, and it gives them options. And so we try to make it where we can. Now, you're right. Making them standard dual slot or triple slot would be great. But what do you do then? If you can fit a 2.2 cooler in, why would you make it a triple slot? Because then that means that anybody that has enough space for a 2.5 can't use that card. But at a 2.2, they can. See where this is going. It, the idea is, is to keep these as thin as possible, but give the noise level and the cooling level of performance uh, to go into this. It, it, that That's the nature of it. Steve just felt a chill, I'm sure. Okay, Decoy, you're going to have to explain that one to me. Um, uh, triple fan cards had a tendency to bend over time. Really? I never saw a card bend. Okay, I got to take that back. I did see a card bin once. Uh, Josh Sniffen did a build for us, the Remiel build, the big, beautiful wood build with the video cards sticking up on it. And if you look online, you can find pictures of it. I dropped it. I dropped the build. And the video card bent uh, because the back plate bent. So I have seen a bit card, but never because they just bent. Uh, you have mentioned expectations of cooling and noise, and, and Steve's been pushing those both for a while. Yeah, okay, let me explain to you why I think the expectations are unrealistic. Let's begin with cooling. 
explain to me what the difference, other than the temperature number, is between 70C and 65C on your typical graphics card when gaming. Explain to me the difference. Now, I'm going to hear arguments about this. The first argument I'm going to hear is, well, the fans can run slower. Uh, well, technically, the fans can run slower either way. So that doesn't work. And then I hear the argument, well, the card will last longer. When a card is designed, with a chip, I'm sorry, is designed to run at 85, 90C before throttling, and you're at 70C, you're not going to reduce the lifespan of that ship. And running at 60 isn't going to expand the lifespan of that ship. Okay, you're going to be right in the normal lifespan. And then add to the fact that the lifespan of the actual ship is probably 8 to 10. I've got video cards that are 8 to 10 years old. Most video cards' failures have nothing to do with the chips themselves. They usually have to do with a failure in the fan, or they have to do with a voltage spike, or a sag in, in power, a brownout. It, it's something else. It wasn't the chip just died. So the difference of the chip temperature isn't going to drastically affect performance when it's designed to run at a much higher temperature to begin with. But we get this unrealistic expectation. We think everything has to run at, at as low a temperatures as possible and, and, and be as, as, as cool and quiet as possible. And, and I get that Steve is a crusader on this topic. Uh, I, am, I am a decoy. But consider this. I can build you a graphics card that can run at 50C when under gaming load. Now... Let, let's let's consider this, though. I have to up the price by about 40% because I just put on a ridiculously massive cooler. And it's not a triple slot anymore. Now it's a quad slot. And it only weighs more than the whole PC combined without it. Does that make sense to anyone? It's easy to armchair quarterback. It's easy to sit back and, and come up with these why things need to be a certain way. But there's a difference between looking at stuff after it's done and actually designing stuff from the beginning. Designing a video card is a very complex process. And I'm not talking about the chip design. Okay, I've talked about this topic before. When we design a video card, here's the process that gets involved. We have a price point we want to hit. We have a cooling or a temperature level we want to hit. We have a noise level we want to hit. We have a performance level we want to hit. And we want to hit all four of those. Well, it's impossible to hit all four. So you begin to compromise. Well, the price point is the most difficult one to compromise on because that's a big consideration for consumers. So now you have to compromise on the cooling, on the noise, or on the performance level. And it becomes a balancing act of finding the way to make all these things fit in and work within the parameters you're given. Now, it's easy to sit back and go, well, that card should only run at... How do you know that? Were you involved in the design process? Don't get me wrong. I love Steve. I love the stuff he does. Steve Burke does really good work, and I, 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 I love working with him. But sometimes we get crazy about this. Let me give you an example that's even closer to home that I can get specific on. I have in my main rig a, a, a Ryzen 5900X. Now, I run this on, you're, you're not going to believe this. Nobody believes this when I tell them this. I run this on a big Shuriken 3 from Scythe for the cooler. This is a low-profile cooler, but I'm running the 5900X on that cooler. When I tell people that, they're like, oh, no, there's no way. You can't run it on that. It's got to be ADC all the time, and that cooler is going to be loud, and it's going to be noisy. Nope, it's cool and it's quiet. When I run gaming, I run in the high 60C. And as far as noise level, it, it, it's not so loud that I notice it. 
And because of this, I'm able to keep it running. Now, cooler, absolutely I could run it cooler. Why do I need to run it cooler? It's, stay, it's not throttling. It's staying well within its performance parameters. But, but you see, that's not sexy to talk about on a review topic. Review topics are too easy to get, to get crazy and to go to the extremes. And um, as, as Bliv pointed out, they don't do small fo- form factor buildings often. And small form factor building changes your whole dynamic of how this goes. Speaking of which, then, let's move on to the other topic I was going to move on to. 1080p and high-end graphics cards. Uh, Tommy asks, speaking of cooling, uh, any cooling options that you saw that makes you shake your head at the pure garbage performance from a commercial company? Hold on a moment. I need a drink. And actually, that should have been vodka, just because that question makes me want to makes me want to cringe. And Tommy, I would love to answer that question, but out of professional courtesy and just being a gentleman, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Yes, there are cooling solutions I've looked at uh, from numerous companies that make me shake my head and, and make me wonder what they were thinking. There are case designs that it it there there's a saying amongst us that have been in this industry a long time. Engineers are intelligent and wonderful people, but the problem is they never actually use the product they make, so they don't know what the hell they're doing. And we see that all too often. We see beautifully engineered devices, beautifully engineered keyboards, mice, headphones, cases, fans, everything. And 90% of the time, it was over-engineered and overpriced to deliver to us what we needed. So I'm going to be polite, though. I'm not going to call one out specifically because I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm going to be polite. I'm going to be polite. One comes to mind really quickly, and and but I'm going to be polite. Okay, so 1080p and high-end gaming cards. Uh, this guy on Reddit posted this. I wear hip waders and I trudge through Reddit. Yes, I do. You'll see me there, by the way. So he posted a question about he had a 6800 or 6800 XT and his 1080p gaming numbers didn't make any sense to him. Um, I'm not always professional, Tommy. Trust me, I'm not always professional, but I've had no alcohol yet today, so I'm okay. Um, (laughs) I am decoy. We have confirmed sightings of Sapphire Ed on Reddit. Everybody grab your guns. All right. Um, so 1080p and and high end gaming cards. The the reviewer and the enthusiast community to the less experienced introduce some information that's false, and I want to I want to clarify it. When they test a video card, what they do is is they get the highest possible CPU they can get in it, so that the A load, the entirety of the load is put upon the video cards. When they test a CPU, they get the the highest possible graphics card they can get so that they can test the CPU without the video card being the restricting factor. Well, when you get down to 1080p, this all blows up. And the reason it blows up is High-end video cards tend to get, as silly as this sounds, worse performance at lower resolutions. Now, why is that? Well, I'm, th- there's a lot of technical answers here, and I'm not going to give you the technical answers because I don't want you to go to sleep. The simple nature of this can be explained by going back a few years. Intel introduced a triple... Um, what was it, triple-threaded or, or triple-channeled RAM. They introduced triple-channeled RAM. They also introduced quad-channeled RAM. And the idea was this was supposed to take the enthusiast level of the gaming world by storm, and it never did. And the reason why was it was never able to be used. You see, if you get a product, if you get a high-end, super-fast bit of RAM, and you get massive amounts of RAM... If you can't fill it, if you can't fill the pipeline, if you can't use it to its full potential, it spends its time bored. 
it can't use everything it can use, so it doesn't run at full tilt. The same thing happens with a graphics card. So everything is feeding data to the graphics card. Well, if the CPU can't feed the graphics card enough data to really go hog wild nuts like it wants to, the graphics card runs at lower power levels because it's not getting its data. You're not filling the pipeline. You're not giving it the data it needs to be out there and doing its thing. This is why, and I don't understand why this discussion doesn't take place in these pundits on their on their YouTube channels because I think it'd be a great discussion. By the way, I saw a YouTuber in here earlier. Where's he at? Up, oh, he disappeared. Okay, I saw a YouTuber in here earlier, and and he needs to to look at doing this because I think this would be a great video. It's a balancing act. If you're going to run 1080p, buying a 6800, a 6800 XT, a 6900 is a waste of your money. It, it's not that you're getting a bad card, you're getting a great card. And if you're looking down the road to move to 1440p or to 4K, then yeah, you've already got it and you're ready to go. But you're not going to get the same experience out of it for the money that you would have gotten with a 6700 or a 6600. Because those cards are closer to being filled to their potential at that high refresh rate 1080p. They're not wasting their time. Now, if you want to run the ultra high-end card at 1080p, you can, but now you've got to buy an ultra high-end CPU so it can fill the pipeline. It can keep the pipeline filled. This is why we tell people you need to balance your build. You're going to build a 1080p system. Okay, so you want a CPU like a 3600 or maybe a 5600. And you want a 6600 XT, maybe a 6700 XT, but I think a 6600 XT, you're still going to do fine at 1080p. And you're up and gaming, and you're enjoying, and everything's rocking. And you saved money. The money you save can now be used to get better RAM, better peripherals, a better monitor, more hard drive space, better cooling options, better case. can be used for a ton of things. But instead, because of the way this stuff, it better meals, exactly. Because of the way this stuff is looked at by most pundits, you've got a large community of gamers are coming in, and they don't understand that the pundits are looking at the extreme. This, this goes back to the cooling discussion. People talk to me about the cooling on their, on their video cards and stuff. Well, I, well, we'll use CPUs because CPUs are a little easier because there's actually some simple benchmarks that make it easy to do this. I'm looking at my CPU cooling solution, and when I run um, Cinebench in a loop for 30 minutes... It's hitting ADC. What's wrong with my cooler? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Because Cinebench and, and most benchmarking software takes everything to the extreme. It goes nuts to the top. It's supposed to go top. It's called a stress test. Okay? It's not called a everyday use test. It's called a stress test. And so it goes nuts to the top. And it's the same thing with what the reviewers do. They're going nuts to the top. When you pull everything back down into reality, when you come back down into the reality we have to live in, where, and, and by the way, I technically don't even live within the reality. I get a lot of computer parts given to me. But when you live in the reality that you have to buy the computer parts, you have to buy the processor, you have to buy the, the video cards, you have to buy these things, it makes sense to look at what's going to give you what you need instead of what some reviewer says the best out-of-the-box benchmarking numbers are at resolutions and settings and stuff that you'll never use. All right? It, 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 for example, a, a 6600 XT, why would anybody even look at it at 4K? What's the point? If you're a 4K gamer, are you really going to buy a 6600 XT? I don't think so. I don't think you're going to buy a 6700 XT. If you're a 1440p gamer, you might buy a 6600 XT, and it's worth looking at it. But are you going to look at a 550 
an RX 560, an RX 570 at 1440p? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So this is the this is the the disconnect that takes place. You got to find a balance to the PC you're going to build. You got to make it balanced because balanced is what makes it work. All right. Hey, we've got 45 minutes. Land War misses you. I miss you guys too. I I miss you guys. I love hanging out. They get me this seat. I'm I'm right across from the admins and right next to the concession stand. So I've always got people coming up and saying hi, hanging out. Uh, it it's it's a great event. By the way, if you're anywhere in the and we've got some land war people here, thank you guys. Uh, we love sponsoring you guys. It, it's an awesome event. I, I love being there. Uh, I told the wife she didn't have to work this weekend. I was going to make her jump in the car with me today or, to, or today and just drive out to hang out for a few hours. Uh, but she had to work. Damn it. I hate when real life gets in the way. We was just going to come hang out for a few hours and, and, and say hi. We can't. I can't do it. She's got to work. She's at work right now. All right. I've got one other topic. I've actually got two other topics listed, but I've only got one other I'm going to touch on. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a chance. I'm going to grab a drink of water. If you've got questions or comments, post them. Let's hear them. Speaking of cooling, what do you think of, by the way, I, wow, it's nice to see all these land war people, a million man land folks coming in here. Thank you guys. Uh, I miss you guys. The breakout groups are a blast. We sit in a, for those of you that have never been to the event, we we sit in this lounge and I'm stuck in a corner with about 50 gamers around me. And I better have the right answers or the riot could kill me. Um, oh, my God. Um, Bliv asks, uh, speaking of coolers, what do you think of passively cooled cards? I think passively cooled cards are awesome. Um, I, I think the biggest problem you have with a passively cooled card is the size of the heat sink you need to make it be functional. Take a look at what Noctua did with their CPU heat sink for passive cooling, which is, it, it, it's, it's glorious. It's massive. Okay, I, I'd have to lift weights for a week just to be able to pick the damn thing up. Uh, it's, it's a passively cooled cards are, you're going to have to go to really low powered GPUs to be able to make a passively cooled card a decent option. And at a certain point with low-powered GPUs, you begin to get to a point of diminishing return. It, it becomes more practical to buy an APU and just use the onboard if you're to that low a power of GPU. I mean, if you're only using your GPU to, to watch HD video and to YouTube channels and and we won't judge you if you go to Pornhub. If that's the kind of usage you're using the video card for, an APU does a great job. And and those are the levels of graphics cards you've almost got to get down to today to really go passive. So passive is a neat idea. I'm not sure passive is practical. All right. Um Old Sapphire 3870 Ultimate yesterday. It, it That was a great card. I love that card. That was a great... Some of the older cards to me just had some of the best designs. The uh, Vega uh, Tri-X that we did had a, had a cooler that to this day... I, I talked to Ryan from a non-tech now and then. To this day, he said it was probably still the quietest, most efficient cooler he's ever seen on a graphics card. And he actually said that in the review. All right. If you haven't done this yet, I invite you to go do this. Go over to YouTube, look for Hardware Canucks, and look for a video Dimitri recently did. And, and this is specifically about NVIDIA RTX, but I think it talks about everything. NVIDIA RTX in 2021, a gamer's perspective. He's talking about ray tracing and where we're at today. And is ray tracing something we as gamers need to be worried about yet? And I love what he said. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the TLDR of this is... No, 
it's there yet. The idea of ray tracing, the concept of ray tracing is amazing. And it's a holy grail of PC gaming that we've been chasing for decades. Ray tracing is not new. The concept of ray tracing is not new. We've been trying to do it for a long time. And the ray tracing you're getting today is not the ray tracing we want. What you're getting today are reflections and shadows. That's all you're getting today. True ray tracing, rendering, or rasterization would be done. True ray tracing, you'd put the triangles out there and then the light would bounce and that would give it everything. You'd tell it the texture, but you wouldn't do anything else. The light bouncing would give it the effect. It would make it look the way it was supposed to look. And true ray tracing scenes are gorgeous. They just look incredible. But the amount of horsepower you need to do real-time ray tracing is nothing short of nuts and nothing on the market today and nothing probably on the market for the next few years is even going to come close to having the potential to do true ray tracing. So what we have today are reflections and shadows. And Dimitri didn't use these words, but he practically said the same thing I said earlier about looking at differences in image quality. To enjoy the ray tracing... You have to, one, find a game that implements it well, which isn't as easy as it sounds. But then, two, have to be willing to stop, pause, and soak in the ray tracing. Well, I don't know what video games you're playing, but I have not played many video games where I can spend time and do that. The one example that, that I could do that was The Witcher 3. The Witcher 3, I actually, I, I freely admit it, I would stop and watch the sunset. I, I, I would take screenshots of the sunset. Now, I never zoomed to 200% level to get it, but I, I would stop and watch the sunset. Now, games that allow you that ability to stop and to really absorb the ambience that they have created, ray tracing can, in its current form, be an amazing thing. I'm not going to take away from that. But look at the games they're putting it in. They're putting it in game, constant motion and action. They're putting it in shooters. They're not putting it in, in deep RPGs that are story-driven and that are slow-paced and that drive you forward and pull you in from the depth of the story. And the graphics are an afterthought. They're doing it in games where the graphics are front and center of the forethought. And these are the games that ray tracing doesn't really benefit. So where do we stand in 2021 with ray tracing? Ray tracing is not something you should even be considering. Ray tracing is a useless consideration right now. Don't get excited about it. Don't get all, 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 all freaking out if your car does or doesn't support it. It's not a big deal right now. Most games do a crappy job of implementation. And the few that do a good job of implementation, the implementation tends to be fairly minor. On the whole, ray tracing is just not a viable selling point. Not for gamers yet. It's just not there. Uh, let's see. Uh, hard to enjoy a scene when moving super quick around it. Uh, most people just turn it off because it's a waste of resources. Uh, sir, I, I actually do that with shadows. and I don't turn them off. I, everybody turns their shadows up to maximum. Have you ever looked at a shadow in a video game at maximum and then gone outside and looked at a real shadow? They're not that sharp. They're, they're a little blurry around the edges. In a video game, when I look at shadows, I swear to God, I can tell if my character's circumcised or not from his shadows. I always turn shadows down to medium because there's just no reason to have them at the ultra detail level. God rays are fun, Spence. And, and hi, Spence. Thanks for joining us. God rays are fun. I like God rays. But even those get overused. There's so much effort to get crazy on the graphics. And, and while the graphics are fun and the graphics are cool, the graphics are only a portion of what makes a great video game. And I believe too much game developers have, have leaned on graphics like a crutch. 
and it it's just really sad. They've they've taken a great concept for a video game, and they've made amazing graphics, then wimped out on every other part of it, and and they want you to believe what they made was an incredible video game, a, a, a great video game. A great video game with crappy graphics is still a great video game. A truly sad video game with amazing graphics is still a sad video game. Um, we can blame that on the PS4 and X-Bone for the cause that CPUs are so weak that they have to utilize the GPU. Eh, you, you know what? I ain't going to lay fault on, on consoles for anything. The CPU gaming market's been around for forever compared to consoles. The truth is, if we're doing things wrong in this end, we're doing the things wrong. Not It's not their fault. So, um, one other topic then real quick, and then, then I'm going to pack this in, unless you guys just dilute me with questions and comments that I have to respond to. Have you ever had those quintessential gaming moments? Those moments when you're playing a video game with your friends and... The fun just gets so ridiculous that you want to jump up and scream and yell and shout and dance. And and those moments are... are I, I play a lot of video games. I, and I've played over the years a lot of... And those moments are few and far between. The, the truly awe moment. The truly almost religious experience moment. And I had one last night. The first one I've had since I've been sick. And it was it was incredible, and uh, I I won't get into the specifics because unless you understand Mech Warrior, you won't understand anything I'm going to talk about. But it, it if you haven't had one of those moments, search for a new game. You got to find a game that gives you those moments. Those moments that when you have finished the match, you're dripping in sweat, you're shaking from adrenaline. And even if you lost, you won. Those incredible moments, those are what make PC gaming special. Um, Ferret said, let's see here. Okay, Bliv said he wishes for multi-screen, uh, split-screen multiplayer was still an option. God, I don't. <laughs> I was always confused. I didn't know which screen I was supposed to look at. Um Spence said uh, 1080p and 720 on new consoles uh, would be dope. Yeah, Gears of 5 lets you do it on a PC with split screen. God, Gears of War 5 on split screen? Oh my God, that drives me insane. I, I wouldn't know what to look at. That's crazy. I, I don't get split screen. I really don't. I, I, I have enough trouble with multi-monitor setups where I've got like Discord on one side and the game in front of me, and I... Y my attention span drifts to the other. It, it, it's like I'm a dog and I'm running across the yard and my master's got a bone in that squirrel and then I take off to the side. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just switched back to one monitor. I can't I can't do multi-monitor displays. I want to I want to go everywhere. With my eyes, I want to constantly. It, it, you get into an action game, and you got to pay attention, even if it's a slow action game like Mech Warrior. But that's okay. Uh, the old console days were incredible. I'm not going to say they weren't. Um, but yeah, split screen is not what I want to get back to. I never want to get back to split screen. Uh, it's nice for when you have those options that you have only one system around. Well, there's also turn based play. There, there's turn-based play. I remember playing Jumpman on the Commodore 64 where we'd all take turns and, and compare high scores. So there was always turn-based play. We did Galaga that way. We did Asteroids that way when we had it on consoles. Mean Bean remembers Jumpman. Oh, my God. Mean Bean, you must be an old man. <laughs> If you only knew how many hours I had at Jumpman, you can do Civilization turn-based, um, and you could do it, 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 yeah, Civilization, Mario. Uh, yeah, Civilization turn-based is a lot of fun, but even then we don't split-screen. BB just turned 50. Yeah, I hit 58, and I started gaming when I was... 
14. So, oh, God, I'm old. Speaking of that, I don't have a way to... I, I didn't set up a camera to show you guys pictures. Uh, some interesting personal news I'll give you guys. Uh, my daughter is expecting my first grandchild. So I'm about to be a grandpa. In fact, next Saturday is the gender reveal party. And I get to find out if I'm getting a little granddaughter or a little grandson. I told her she needs to have three or two more kids. That way the three grandchildren and grandpa can make a full lance and mech warrior. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mean Mean. <laughs> yes, it's an important goal. My my daughter's already made clear that I can't teach the kids how to video game because they don't want to, she doesn't want them stuck in it like I am. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to be a girl, Mean Bean, and I'll tell you why. My daughter still, even though they're in their 30s, they have a look that they give me when we're out doing something together. That is the same look they gave me when they were 10, when they were 8, when they were 6. That same look of dad is awesome. And I want that again with a granddaughter. Sons, I have found, keep that look for their mothers. So, yeah, I'm hoping it's a granddaughter. You know what? I don't really care. It, as long as it's healthy, I'm happy. That's all I care about. All right. So you got a couple of minutes, any questions or comments left, and then I'm going to go. Those of you at Million Man Land that joined us, thank you. I appreciate you all. I love you all. I miss you all. Tell Lady Waza a little pissed off she wasn't here. <laughs> oh, they can hear me. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Is, is Lady Waz in the room? <laughs> oh. Oh, my God. That's awesome. Um, they should redo a lot of games, Mean Bean. Um, I, I'd like to see a lot of games redone. Th there were some great games. I'd like to see the Starfleet Command series redone. Uh, I'd like to see a lot more work into the Mech Warrior series. Um, from from the role playing stuff, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I think EverQuest would be really cool in, in Unreal. Uh, I think the Final Fantasy stuff could be made better. Yeah, they did say they might live stream me. I did. I I just didn't realize they did. I thought they were just going to send everybody over to say hi. <laughs> now my breakout group was forced upon the masses. Oh, that's funny. Uh, even WoW could use an upgrade. Absolutely. Well, to all you people at, at Million Man Land, I love you all. I wish I was there. Um, You can remaster everything, but after a while, the stuff that can get remastered runs out. And, and you know what? Sometimes a remake doesn't make any sense. Um, I've told the story before. I was, I was doing some live streaming back when I guess I didn't want a social life. I was doing some live streaming, and I found the remake of Leisure Suit Larry, where they remastered it. And I bought Leisure Suit Larry, and I live streamed Leisure Suit Larry. And I had so many great hours of gameplay in Leisure Suit Larry when it first released. I played this for about 30 minutes, and I stopped. And I asked the live stream, I said, is it just me or is this not fun anymore? <laughs> it, 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 there comes a point certain things shouldn't be remade. Certain video games, certain movies, um, they shouldn't be remade. They were masterful at their time. They were masterful in what they created. And there's just a point that you don't need to remake them. So, uh, haven't... Majora Mask? Okay. Now you guys are getting off into the weeds on me. Okay, guys. On that note, I think it's time to pack this recording in and let me get this uploaded to Sapphire and they can post this on our YouTube channel. If you only got to hear part of it and you want to hear the whole thing, it'll be there on the YouTube channel. Uh, again, thank you all for coming out 
and and enjoying this time with me. I appreciate it. We'll do this again next month. I'll see if we can get a guest in next month. Uh, I hope you guys go out and play some video games. Thanks, Tommy. I, I, I hope Lady Waza was there because I'm hoping she gets on Discord and reads me the riot act. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it, it was great spending the time with you guys. Go play some video games. Go have some fun. If you haven't played it yet, go play Mech Warrior. Blowing up big stompy robots is a lot of fun. On that note then, I am out of here, guys. I will see you next month, or I'll see you around on Discord. I'm always around. And war, I'm hoping I'm going to see all of you in January. You guys have a great weekend, and I am signing off. Bye!